smiling faces. <laughs> Amen. I am the pastor of the Mott Haven Reformed Church at 146 and 3rd Avenue. And um, I'm going to put my bid in, too. You know, the bid? I'm going to put my bid in, too. <laughs> we have pre-service prayer at 10 a.m. Yes, yes, Service starts immediately afterwards. Yes. We have wonderful blended <laughs> worship. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And we are open for all of y'all to come and worship with us. And so we say that we are the church in the heart of the community, with the community in the heart of the church. And so because of that, we find that it is our obligation to be here tonight with this forum at this critical time in our community and this critical time in our nation. And it's important that you have come tonight. But like Pastor Duckett said, it is really important that you vote. You may think that your vote doesn't mean anything, but your vote carries a lot of weight. Your vote is your voice. So this evening, as you listen to the candidates, think deeply about what they are saying to you. Think about who is the best candidate to represent your needs in this community. So we want to, our candidates have already been introduced. Our candidates will have three minutes to answer the questions. So now we know that there are a lot of questions that we can't address tonight. And we know that you have a lot of questions. And so we have chosen some questions that are priority for the faith-based community, okay? But at the end of this forum, uh, we will have a set of questions that you have written down on your cards, and then we will address those questions. So we're going to start with an opening question, and then community members will ask you specific questions, okay? We need to be respectful of everybody in the house. We need to be respectful of the house of God. The candidates know what their time frame is. The candidates have already been instructed about being civil to each other. They assured me that they are friends. So we're gonna have a friendly conversation this evening. So our opening question is to the candidates, what is your overarching vision as a leader for this community, for the Mott Haven community, for the next four years, if you win the seat. You have three minutes to respond, and we have a timekeeper who's going to keep you on time. All right. All right, so I'm Tamika Mapp, by the way. When I'm elected as city councilwoman, I'll be working closely with Assemblyman Rodriguez and Congressman Espelot to improve the district's quality of life by holding NYCHA accountable for their upkeep and ongoing repairs in each development. By working with progressive leaders to increase the minimum wage to $20 per hour so no one work three to six jobs to make ends meet. By working with the New York City Department of Environmental Protection to make sure when our ambulance and our film crew is being idle, that they're protecting our air that we breathe in. Working with my city council colleagues to provide an affordable pathway to citizenship for all law-abiding, long-term residents in the district. And by working with my city council colleagues to preserve affordable housing and make sure we have enough rent-stabilized homes in the district. And by saying no to all rezoning throughout the district. I think that what I would like to see happen in the, in the South Bronx and one of the issues that I would like to concentrate a lot of attention is uh, obviously is a housing related uh, issue. We represent a district that is split evenly between East Harlem and the South Bronx and in the East Harlem part of the district we've already started to see rapid gentrification that has been ongoing for the last 11 years since I've been with the speaker. And that gentrification is slowly creeping into the South Bronx because you know, many people who wouldn't even be caught, 
you know, walking the streets of my haven, uh, now find it really not as bad, right? It's really nice. You can get waterfront access uh, to, your, to apartments that are still relatively affordable. Um, so housing is definitely going to be on the forefront of what I would like to focus on, building more affordable housing, uh, preserving existing units. We see a lot of harassment of residents in this district as it is. We have, while I was working for the City Council Speaker, we opened an office specifically here in the South Bronx at uh, 137th and St. Anne's to be able to provide uh, residents and constituents uh, services they weren't, they were not receiving. We don't have an abundance of social service agencies in this community. Unfortunately, we don't have access to free legal services uh, directly in the vicinity of the Mott Haven area. So we were able to bring those resources to the district uh, through the speaker's office, and I would like to be able to continue to build on that. We have uh, attorneys that deal with housing rights issues. We have attorneys that work with undocumented uh, city, um, residents as well. Wow. Um, but I would like to continue to build on that work. Thank you for your responses. I want you to remember to please be patient with the candidates and also our candidates to be mindful of our timekeeper. <laughs> I, at this time, I would like to pass the mic again over to our Pastor Sealy and she will give you another question on defending our immigrant community. This question comes from Margarita Cabrera from St. Luke Catholic Church. In our community, there is anger, fear, and insecurity when we speak about the treatment of immigrants all over this country. When people heard what President Trump was threatening, many people in our community decided to go back to their country of origin with all of their family members. Everyone feels so much fear due to the reality of what we are facing with ICE showing up in all areas previously known as safe, such as churches, schools, and courthouses. You are running for office in a district where we have a speaker that was and is a champion of immigrants, especially when it comes to the funding set aside for the NYIFUP. Are you on the side of the speaker who advocated to provide funds and services to the immigrant without taking into account their criminal history? Or are you on the side of the mayor who wants to deny legal support to some immigrants? And we're going to give you extra time since there's two of you instead of three of you. So we will give you four minutes each. I'm, I'll, I'll take the, 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 I guess I'll go first this time. Um, so the, the, the NIFA program actually be, was started, it was initiated by the City Council in 2013. And this year we were hoping that the mayor would streamline um, it, the, the expense of that, that pro program into the, the city's budget. He did that. He actually increased the budget as well, which we were really excited about. But then he imposed some restrictions. Uh, that stipulated that if you had been convicted of a criminal, um, some sort of crime, you know, of, of a crime, that you would no longer benefit from free legal services if you had to go through the deportation process. Um, we uh, strongly believe that the program was intended to serve all people, that everyone is entitled to due process, and I stand with the speaker on this one. I believe that the original intent uh, was what it was. Nothing has changed on our end, and you know, so I stand with her. I'm on the side of due process. Um, every resident of the district has a right to representation. Moreover, this is why I feel it's important that long-term residents have an affordable pathway to citizenship to remove the worry and fear caused by undocumented status. If we can increase the number of residents have 
with a legal status, we can decrease um, the deportation hearing. In the meantime, we must continue to fund NIFU for everybody in the district. We are thankful to hear that both candidates are for the rights of immigrants. It's, it's so much to know that people in this country and in this community and in this local district are still welcomed, even though they might not fit in, they might not look the same, and they might not speak our language, but they're still welcome and loved by these two candidates. Our next question would be from our sister, Ashley Ellis, she will be talking about preserving affordable housing and protecting our housing. Sister Ashley Ellis, at this time. So my question is, can y'all hear me? A little. Y'all can't hear me? Can y'all hear me? All right, there we go. All right, all right. Put my candidate's voice on. Um, we have folks living in the community due to fear. We have folks being harassed by their landlords and unable to get the repairs they need in their homes. We have folks in public housing who are uncertain about what the national administration means for the security of their housing. Plus, the gentrification of our community has only been visibly increasing month by month. As community members, we need to be absolutely clear about who are our elected officials for. Are you for our current community members, local business owners and tenants, or are you for the for-profit developers and landlords? In addition to advocating for the passage of the Certificate of No Harassment, which you all said you supported in the Voter's Guide, what other specific plans do you have to protect our people against displacement if elected? So I'm always for the community because I am the community. I think we are one of the same. One of the committees I intend to form is a housing committee which have representatives from all housing types. The tenant bill that just got passed from the city council is a great start, but it's our job as a city council woman to educate our community on their rights when it comes to landlord harassment and making sure our tenant advocate department is answering all complaints properly as well. Instead of funding shelters, we need to take the money and support our community programs like Bronx Works so our residents can have a safety net to stay in their community. We also need to invest in community land trust programs to make sure we have an affordable housing for every income bracket throughout this district. Um, I, obviously, I actually grew up in public housing. I, moved to the South Bronx when I was 17 years old after coming out of a shelter with my son. I lived in an apartment that I could not afford to pay because I had no business having an apartment at that age. I was paying $430 a month. I was living off of public assistance and I still could not afford to pay my rent. And I was very uh, lucky to find in the borough president's office uh, the assistance that I needed in connecting me uh, to the JIGITS program, which is now known as the FEPS program. I then transitioned to a project-based Section 8 building that subsidized my rent and allowed me to take jobs that didn't pay me the wages that I deserved. Um, I understand the need and I understand uh, how valuable affordable housing is to communities like these because this is, a, my, these are, this is my community as well. My children are now a little older. They both are employed and not making enough money uh, to stay in, in these communities any longer. And so that is obviously something that really concerns me because when we talk about affordable housing, you know, that's my family. Right? We're not people that are financially well off. I don't come from a family you know, of real estate developers. Um, so I want to make sure that my family and your family is able to, be able to stay in the community that raised them. Um, what we have done, however, in the past, again, I have um, a little dis you know, advantage here because I have been working for the city council speaker's office for the last 11 years. We've been able to, uh, to, put up, to bring up the uh, Tenant Protection Act. Uh, which allows residents an opportunity to sue their landlords if they're being harassed, right? Which we didn't have access to before. We also have now right to counsel, so every person, regardless of you know whatever uh, the income that they're bringing in, is entitled to. Well, actually, that's not accurate. 
you can still, you, you, there's still a, an income cap, but it's a little bit higher than it was. But it, it, it assures that the people that need the services the most are guaranteed to get an attorney to come in with them. Um, we've also passed legislation prohibiting landlords from making uh, multiple buyout offers. So before your landlord could ask if you, you know, if he could buy you out, and if you said no, he would show up in your house 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and he would do this repeatedly, and he would harass you until you accepted the offer. Well, it is now illegal to do that. He can ask you once, and you can say no, and if he does it again, you can report him. Um, there's also, uh, we've also just passed, you know, uh, several pieces of legislation making it, um, you know, classifying construction as harassment as well, because construction has often been used as a tool to get residents out of their existing units. Uh, we have the legal clinics at the, at the district offices, which I explained about earlier, and we also raise the income qualification for the screen and dream program to try to keep the disabled and the, the elderly in existing units without the burden of increasing rent. So we've done a lot of work already. There's always a lot of work to be done, and I look forward to doing that as your next city council member. We are grateful that people that lived here 40, 50, 20, or 30 years are still having access to live near the waterfront or near where they're accustomed to living, near the shopping area, near the hub. We are grateful that you guys, both candidates, are in agreement to keeping the people that lived here, founded this neighborhood, put their investments in this neighborhood, lived in this neighborhood, are still able to stay here. I think everybody should give them a round of applause for that. <laughs> Something amazing because we see that gentrification is coming and we have to be prepared for it, but it's good to know that you have our backs, both candidates. One question I do want to talk about is, we have, we have asked you guys, both candidates, about legislation regarding police accountability. Uh, we've asked all three candidates who are supposed to be here. The one who did not answer is not here. But the, the two that did answer are here. So we want to definitely hear from them. Uh, just a quick story from myself being a young minority uh, that pastors in the Bronx. I was coming out of the church that I pastored, uh, walked across the street to my car, uh, I'm not a famous pastor. I don't drive an expensive car. <laughs> so I was driving my regular car, and they pulled me over and said that they saw me fundling or fondling against the locks and the gates of the church. I had one of the members in the car with me, and I was kind of shocked because I was in a suit and tie, and, and I was trying to figure out if you saw me with keys coming out of the church, how would it be that I'm trying to fondle or harass or break into a place that has my name on it? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. But and with, all, with all due respect to authority, I did cooperate and he let me go with no charges or nothing else. But I did speak to his inspector, who's a good friend of mine, and Inspector Brian Hennessy, and I'm grateful to have his rela relations with him. And he gave the guy desk duty for a couple of weeks, and I was Good excited for you. about that. Good for you. Good for you. But with, with all due respect to their authority, we still have rights as citizens that live in this area. And we want to know from both candidates, Pastor, Pastor Celia already said that we have given you four minutes, so we want you to take your time and elaborate on the such incidents that's been going on regarding police brutality and police accountability. But we also want to know, have you ever experienced anything in that nature? Uh, part two to the question, if I'm allowed, is that there's a lot of drug and black-on-black -black crime that's happening right here in this hub area. And we want to know are you going to hold police accountable not only for the rights of the people, but for stopping and being more aggressive on the crime that's going on in our local area? Thank you. So I support um, both 
legislation said the right to know law. Um, I have a 27-year-old son, so yes, I do educate my son every day of what not to do when he walks across the street. And we shouldn't have to do that in our own communities. I'm all about com um, committees, so the other committee that I'm going to be forming is called Community Safety. It will have the district's residents as well as the community organizations such as Com Communities United for Police Reform and Picture the Homeless. I'll be working with each precinct captain by holding a monthly committee meeting to make sure we're getting treated fairly in our communities as well as officers have the tools and support they need um, to do their jobs properly. Community residents and officers want the same thing, a safe and orderly community free from violence and harassment. By talking to each other and collaborating on how to achieve these goals with mutual respect, can we weed out the bad apples and be successful? We must also recognize that policing is a difficult and stressful occupation as well. It's important that their mental health is monitored frequently and if necessary, judgment-free treatment is provided. I would like to see the police officers take an annual psychological exam to make sure they continue to protect and serve with courtesy, professionalism, and respect. I also happen to have a son who's 27 years old. Um, that's why we get along. I was, a, I, was, I was 15 when I had that one. Um, and so, you know, my son is a, is, is a, is a person of color. We lived in the vicinity of the 50th precinct here in the South, in the Bronx, for many years. And in his teenage years, he was regularly stopped by the police. He would either fit the description of somebody that had committed a crime, uh, he looked like he was up to no good, his pants were sagging, his attitude was bad, um, he never got arrested, he never got a summons, but he continued to get harassed to the point that it was daily daily harassment for no reason. One day he walked outside from the house after a nap to go to the store. He helped a woman into the building with her carriage and they immediately stopped him and they handcuffed him for a little while while they searched him because he looked like he fit the description of somebody who had just burglarized a, a, an apartment in the area. Um, so I know this very well and I am very supportive of the Right to Know Act bills. I actually have been endorsed by the New York City Council uh, Progressive Caucus who has been championing these bills for quite some time. And I, you know, if elected to the City Council, hope to be able to ensure that these bills pass. Having said that, I also have a lot of conversations with my son, and I have three now, um, about having respect for the police. Because I, I think that we run on, on, on dangerous, you know, chartered territory when there's this animosity that's building and continuing to build and build and build in our communities. And this is what has been happening for a long time. Our kids are upset. You know, they feel targeted. They're humiliated in front of their peers. Um, but how do we, how do we finish, how do we fix that? And so I have had a lot of conversations with my son about how to conduct himself around the police. But I've also had a lot of conversations with the police department about how to conduct themselves in our community. I visit the, the, the local precincts regularly. I work with the, the, the officers that patrol our streets because it's important to also educate them and to hold them accountable. And I think that we've done that really, really well. I think we've seen uh, some improvements, uh, not perfect yet. It's, this is a, a work in progress, but we need everyone uh, to be a part of this process. Thank you so much. Being a minority myself, or just a person in general, I think police accountability is very much needed in this community uh, on both spectrums, whether to limit on some and to improve on others. So thank you. Can we clap our hands for our candidates? <laughs> yes. I'm going to turn this over to Reverend Seely and she will give us our next section. Okay, the first question we're going to ask has to do with climate change and environmental justice. In the South Bronx, we live in, in, in environmental conditions that are literally killing our people. It's clear that our community has been historically cited as a dumping ground 
for what other boroughs don't want to deal with, such as waste transfer stations, landfills, and polluting power plants. How do you plan to screen for toxins in our existing buildings, drinking water sources, and public and private land, as well as ensure future sustainable development that protects our environment and our health? You have four minutes each. I, I, don't, I, I won't need that much, but I think that, you know, as it relates to, you know, the, the, these issues are real. We, we have one of the, the districts with the highest asthma rates of any other, you know, in the city, and that's unfortunate. We have playgrounds that sit right next to highway, you know, entrances, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Who would put a playground right in front of, you know, uh, a major highway? We have a school right, right by the Bruckner Boulevard. These children are, you know, ingesting these these fumes day in and day out. Um, you know, we, we're getting a lot of development is happening already, and I think that we need to be making a bigger push to ensure that a lot of this development incorporates passive design, that we're building green, um, and that we're putting in, you know, measures that protect the environment, because, you know, we'll, we're not going to live forever, but our children and our children's children will be here, and they deserve to live in an earth that it still exists. Um, we've also, we, we recently did a lot of work around the plastic bag debate, and it was a big issue, because, you know, we don't want to get rid of, my mother didn't want to get rid of the plastic bags, because she's like, I need a little bag. I need the bag because I use it whenever the kids come over and I want to send food you know, home. That's where I pack it up and put it away. And so she hoards all of these bags. When you walk around the South Bronx, there's bags littered through all of our trees, right? The same trees that are supposed to be giving us oxygen. And so we have a big problem. Um, so, you know, building passive uh, design, looking for ways uh, to make the environment uh, better, getting rid of the plastic bags or whatever way we, we can. Um, because we have landfills are full of, you know, of, of these bags. That, um, also, I think that, you know, as it relates to the, the, the water issue, we recently saw a few months ago that there were schools that tested with high levels of lead. A lot of the schools happen to be in, this, in the 8th district, and what we've been able to do is to work with the schools uh, to uh, We've actually allocated capital dollars to put in filtration systems because a lot of the infrastructure, unfortunately, in these schools is really old, and that contributes to the low, the, the, the high lead uh, numbers. Um, but we need to be doing better, and we need to be to ensure that the Department of Health has the resources that they need on hand to test our water supplies um, consistently. Well, first of all, just be an advocate at the city council and say no when they try to bring waste um, transfer station into the district and trying to stand up and trying to figure out where other places they can put these, um, these things. I've been working closely with WEAC, is environmental organization, is a nonprofit environmental organization, and trying to figure out how we can get the pollution down. Like I said earlier, you know, the Department of Environmental Protection, we're going to be working hand in hand because there's some good ideas that we can do, such as um, put in filters on ambulances and our film crew staff, that's to bring down the cleaner air, um, to working with the Department of Environmental Services to making sure that when they test the water, it's the right um, materials and making sure that's not cheap stuff that's catching everything. Um, when the lead broke out, as a matter of fact, my niece went to River East Elementary School when that happened. And um, as a PTA president, I've just provided water for all the classes because they shouldn't be drinking out of that water at all. And I'm going to and ask, ask the state assemblyman what's going on and why he's not, you know, protecting us. And, you know, he doesn't really get back to me. So it's really hard, hard to get change done when everybody is, is not at the table to get it done. So hopefully by me becoming a city councilwoman that I will be able to put foot to fire and making sure they hold accountable for everything that they do in the community. We know that we have a Not 62 campaign that pushes awareness of the need for Bronxites to get moving and get healthy. However, the awareness is not enough 
when folks are working multiple jobs and feeding many mouths. What will you do to encourage healthy lifestyles, such as more green space and infra infrastructure like trails, better bike path, and access to healthy food that is affordable to our people, particularly those that do not have insurance or other economic privilege. It all medically just go back to raising the minimum wage, right? So we need more money and trying to be a big advocate to push $20 per hour. When the push was $15 an hour, I was at every picketed in every place, and it finally got passed. But it's a slow crawl to, get, to do it. So hopefully when it starts rolling out, we can actually have the conversation to actually say $20 per hour. And I work on, I'm a board member for 596 Acres, and one of my jobs is to walk around the community and pretty much figure out where is the empty space that we could put a garden there to educate our community. So I will be working like very um, hand in hand with the community because they will actually get to plant fruits and vegetables and have everything that they need so they can have this the access. Also work closely with our um, grocery stores and trying to figure out how can we help them to provide a lower um, produce environment, um, partner up with Morris Heights um, Community Center because they give out um, food vouchers for um, produce, if nobody knows, now you know, um, that you can get a prescription that says that you want to have healthy food and they actually write you a prescription and you take that to the farmer's market and get your produce. So I would like to see things like that rolled out all the way around for everybody to have access to that. Yeah, the not, the not 62 campaign, um, actually, I have a lot of friends that, uh, that, that are participating now and are challenging each other on social media, which is great because the awareness is there. Um, but what, what are we doing um, to ensure that the Bronx is healthier? We have, again, through City Council Speaker's Office, we were able to see the Bronx Connector come to fruition, which is, was a big, uh, a big deal for us because we had a part of the Bronx that was not utilized that connected us to um, Randall's Island for recreational activity and you know, Bronx Ice didn't have access for a really long time, so we were able to put in some funds for that um, and are excited to see it in action for the last couple of years. We've also been investing funding in the Healthy Bucks campaign, and so we give money, uh, these Healthy Bucks, which are the little coupons uh, to families that you know participate in different programs throughout the district so that they can buy fresh fruits and vegetables at an affordable rate at the local farmers market um, we also work really closely with our local uh, gardens right we have a couple of gardeners here um, who grow these fresh fruits and vegetables and practically practically give them away uh, to the community which is a great you know benefit uh, to Bronx sites and we you know have done some work with the local bodegas to try to get them to uh, change the design right we, we're used to walking into the bodega and we have you know an abundance of sodas and cookies and you know all type of junk food and trying to just just move things around a little bit you know maybe put the fruits and vegetables in the front maybe put the waters up front to encourage people uh, to eat healthier um, but eating healthy is expensive it's really expensive and I know that because I raised a family on public assistance and food stamps and I know that I was the first person in the supermarket buying the juice that you're not supposed to drink because it was the most affordable and it was the one that lasted the longest. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Raising the minimum wage is one way. Um, ensuring that families that are eligible are applying for food stamps. One of the issues that we had when I started working for the city council speaker's office was we had all of this money but people for food stamps and no Nobody was applying and you know there was this uh, confusion about why you know why wouldn't people apply for something that they're eligible for well have any of you ever attempted to apply for food stamps and seen how demeaning that experience can be you know we need to change that culture we need to stop you know uh, making people feel bad because their circumstances may not be you know where certain people expect them to be we don't have the same you know um, we don't all have the same access to the same schools um, 
and you know access to to better jobs and sometimes you know these services are there to help us um, but they restrict the type of foods that we ingest and so um, so we've done a lot again uh, around this area but there's still a lot that needs to be done and you know I, I commit myself to to doing that work to education justice. We have failing schools in Mud Haven. We have a low graduation rate for high school students. And for those who graduate, we have an even lower rate of those who are prepared to go on to higher education. We have a large number of disconnected youth in this community who haven't graduated and can't get a job. How Will you stand against the practices and policies of Secretary Betsy DeVos? And how will you promote and protect our public school system? How will you work with your colleagues to strengthen the standards for both teaching and learning? So I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in vocational training. I think that not all of us are, you know, are born with the instinct of going to school or even the interest. And so uh, vocational uh, high schools offer a very unique opportunity for training for a lot of our young people. Um, and we don't have enough of them. I think in the district we have maybe one, and that one was threatened with being closed. And they, they provide a whole bunch of really great uh, resources to our young kids. They teach them automotive skills, they teach them how to cut hair, they teach them culinary skills, um, they do eyeglasses, you know, in, in these, uh, in these uh, schools. And so I'm a proponent of those. I would love to see more of them as an option, um, because otherwise children are just dropping out of school. Um, obviously, you know, we would, I would, you know, be pushing the state to finally give us all of the money that they owe us. Uh, public schools are severely underfunded, unfortunately, and they cannot do, you know, all of the things that they would like to do. Um, and it's, it's expensive. We have teachers that are paying out of pocket for, uh, you know, supplies. We have parents. I'm a parent. I have two children in school still, and I... Sometimes when I see that list, I want to pass out because that list is very expensive. And for those of you that are shopping this week or next week, you know what I mean. Um, you know, one child can cost you up to $70 just on notebooks and, and folders. So imagine for a family of four and five children, um, it becomes burdensome. And so, uh, you know, I, I, again, I, I am a strong believer, you know, first, obviously, that we need to continue to push the state to give us the funding that, you know, that they owe us, um, but also in promoting more vocational school options as an, uh, an opportunity for our young people. Um, just pretty much standing up for our children and be at every community education councils to make sure that our children is getting the best that they can. Um, it's really troublesome when a second grade grader cannot read or write and they pass them on to third grade. It's not that children's fault. I think we need to go back to basics and actually teach our parents on how, well, we really can't teach our parents how to do nothing because they work in three to six jobs until we pass the minimum wage. So everything is back to my passing the minimum wage so parents can actually be parents. Parents can actually come home and actually see what their children's doing and helping them with their homework. Having quality after school programs um, for our children because you know we, we depend on that. Right now our after school programs, they go in, they put the book bags to the side, they play around instead of getting that extra homework help that they need. I grew up in a boys and girls club back in the day. I don't even see that nowhere near around. When I tried to be a mentor for a, a girl, you know how you, you sign up and you'd be like, oh yes, I want to mentor another little girl? It's very hard to find them programs in the district. I look far and wide. That's the reason why I continue to be a Girl Scout leader. So I can encourage each girl to stay in school and let them know that their options is not limited based on just the circumstances that they have. Making sure that we have quality shelter so when these children is actually sleeping in shelter, they're getting a good night's sleep. Not just trying to figure out should they tuck themselves in because a rat is going to get them or it's very unsafe or unhealthy or somebody's going to be fighting or somebody's going to get stabbed. That's an unsafe environment for that children to do. So all them elements play a part 
of the education system. So we need to change our shelter system and making sure that our assemblyman and our state senator has given us our money. He like to say he's going to give us $3.5 million, but right now our smart boards do not work. Our teachers is like very burdened down with 20 students to one teacher. I believe in small classroom size to really individualize the training for each kid because not every kid learns the same way. I have a niece. She likes to draw as she learned. You know, another kid will like to look in the book and be like, okay, I got this. Everybody learns different ways and we need to be able to teach our teachers that so they can do individualized training so our children can graduate and making sure that we um, get them back at fourth grade if they can't read and write at fourth grade to get that extra help that they need because by the time they get to 11th grade they're either going to drop out of high school or they're going to go to college and take remedial education back in the day that used to suck up our financial aid it was with the remedial classes and I always believe that remedial classes is meant for people who's been out of school for 20 years not just a high school student just graduated from college so we need to really go back to basics and bringing our boys and girls club back into the community and having quality after school programs to be that extra support that the parents need so these children can feel confident in their learning so when they go to school they got it but we need to change our shelter system too and that's the reason why we need to bring our discretionary fund money to small community uh, nonprofit organizations such as Bronx Works so we can provide permanent affordable housing so they don't have to worry about bouncing from shelter to shelter to shelter. to take three of the questions that we've been given from the audience. And I know that um, everybody wants their question answered. So because of time, we can't deal with all of the questions. But what we want you to know that the remaining questions will be posted online on the Facebook event for candidates to answer. And if you feel that your question was not addressed tonight, please note that all candidate contact is available in your programs and that many more issues are covered in our Faith Over Fear Voters Guide included in your program as well. Okay? So the first question we're going to take is, what do you think is the most pressing issue or issues facing this district? It's always going to be housing and minimum wage. Um, you know, without our minimum wage being to a point where we can actually afford where we live, that too is always going to be an issue. And when I talk about affordable housing, I have to talk about wages because to me they're one and the same. They, they wash this each other. If I have more money coming in my paycheck, I can afford $1,200, $2,000 a month um, for housing and don't have to worry if I need to put food on the table, how to get to work, how to get to child care. And that's one of the other things I want to lobby too is trying to figure out how we can do universal child care until our children can be able to go to school at three years old because that will relieve a lot of a burden from parents, especially single parents. So that's, to me, that's the two pressing issues, minimum wage and affordable housing. Um, I would say that housing, I agree with Tamika, housing and I would, but I would also add uh, public safety. Um, housing for a variety of reasons. Our NYCHA housing stock is deteriorating very rapidly. Uh, people are living in apartments that have, um, that are mold infested, uh, that are rat infested with repairs that are sometimes never coming. We have individuals that live in public housing who haven't had working refrigerators in weeks and so we're talking about getting food. Where are they going to store this food? Um, oftentimes they don't have that. Um, how, do we, how are we preserving existing units? How are we ensuring that the residents that, that live here today are not being harassed out of their apartments? Uh, it's, it's something that's a, that's a big problem here in the South Bronx and in the East Harlem part of the district as well. But, so, pu but public safety is also a huge issue. If you ask anyone you know, in this community, most people will tell you that they, don't, they no longer feel comfortable sitting in the local park because they've been shootouts in the playground. Um, and our public housing developments, our seniors no longer feel comfortable sitting in front of the benches to get a little bit of fresh air. 
because there are people shooting. We were actually uh, at one development a few weeks ago, door knocking, and uh, one of the one of my campaign uh, workers has a little app on their phone that tells you uh, when there's a shooting or when there's an incident. Yesterday it alerted us there was a bank robbery, you know, in the near vicinity. And while we were there, there was a shooting, you know, there were shots fired. And so people don't feel safe in their communities anymore. Um, our young kids are killing each other. We have people dying for no reason before. When I was growing up, people were killing each other for drunk, you know, because of drug turf war issues. That's not even the case anymore. We've had a 16-year-old child that was shot and killed last year because he was in the wrong development. You, if you live at a specific development, you're not welcome in this one. And so he took a picture by the sign that says, welcome to so-and-so. Um, and he dared to show up to that development. It was shot in the head and killed, 16 years old. Um, nothing has changed. You know, this is something that uh, has been affecting our community for many, many, many years. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done around public safety. What is your position regarding employment for the residents of this community? Well, I train small business owners um, through a program called Webo. So I will be educating our small business owners to let them know different um, tax brackets and different tax um, credits that you have to employ people in the district. Also, want to make sure that when people coming back and did their time and being incarcerated, that they have an opportunity to come back in the district and actually work there too. Because sometimes our small business owners is kind of biased. They'll be like, oh, do you have a record? You'll be like, yeah. They'll be like, I don't need you. But it's up to the city council members to actually educate these small business owners to let them know that, yeah, they may have a record, but there are excellent employees and look at their background. Because I used to hire um, people who sold drugs and they make the best um, salesperson because you know what? They're smart, they're intelligent, they can flip things, and that's, that's what they did in insurance. I, I sell insurance, I employ them because they have skills that I can use. So just pretty much educating our small business owners and say, yes, they may did it illegally, but this is how they can benefit your community. Yeah. Well, I mean, so the question, we, Yes. Sorry. What is your position regarding employment for the residents of this community? So I'm not sure what the person that asked the question meant by that, because that could be explained in many different ways. Um, we have always been, you know, for, for local hiring uh, initiatives. So that's something that, you know, I would be obviously be pushing. Um, we've been working to ensure that when we have contracts, specifically, you know, in, in public housing for uh, roof rep repair work, for brick work, for new playground renovations, that the residents have uh, access to those jobs as well. Um, but we also need to provide more training to ensure that the people that live here have the skills necessary to uh, take these jobs. Um, is that, does that answer the question? I'm not sure. No? Question to each of you. What have you done in the Bronx, particularly in this community? Well, I go to church in the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, Girl Scouts community um, in the Bronx, um, you know, so we come here and we clean up the sidewalks as our community service um, projects um, from Girl Scouts. So um, I'm just not here for campaigning. I'm just not here for when I drop in and out. I mean, it is across the street from Willis Avenue. I do go, go to the grocery store. Western Beef is my number one store right now since they closed Pathmark. And when I go to Western Beef, I actually have an, um, an insurance client that I live in the projects. And I actually go into her daycare and making sure that her children is getting the best proper um, daycare instructions instead of just sitting in front of a TV. I'm 
actually shown her how to make sure that the kids are pre-K ready by helping them with drawing and their ABCs and how to write and stuff like that. So um, this, the Bronx is not new to me. I'm always going to be here. I'm a community person, and it's my stepping ground. I don't think that the Bronx is separate from East Harlem. When I talk about District 8, I mean everybody. That's the whole up High Bridge, Longwood, Port Morris, Mulhaven. It's everybody, and we need to try to figure out how we're going to come together and start picking the East River and across the bridge and start picking sides. And let's get clean this area up together because I firmly believe that a community that plans together grows a strong foundation for the future of our kids. Well, again, I worked for the city council speaker for 11 years and for uh, 11 years we represented some portion of the Bronx. Four years ago that portion actually was uh, grew and because it was a growth in population and so the district's lines were redrawn and so we went from having maybe 10 percent of the South Bronx to 51 percent of the South Bronx. Um, so I do a lot of work here. I work, I do a lot of organizing in public housing. I am there quite frequently. People know who I am because I spend a lot of time in resident association meetings. Uh, again, we have an office on 137th Street in St. Anne's where we provide constituent services and we provide access to legal assistance. I also do a lot of work with our senior centers because I have a background in senior services and so I do a lot of work uh, at the Patterson Senior Center, Mitchell Senior Center, Betances Senior Center, um, providing them the necessary funding so that they can um, provide their seniors the best level of programming available. Uh, I do a lot of work on public safety matters. So I do a lot of work with the local precincts, um, trying to identify ways that, you know, we as a city council can be helpful uh, to ensuring that the crime rate is reduced. Um, so I've done a lot. I've had the benefit of, you know, working in this community for a really long time. I also work very closely with, you know, our guard, local gardeners and environmentalists and, and, and trying uh, to bring clean air to the South Bronx and bring more fresh fruits and vegetables. So we do provide a lot of funding for stuff like that. Um, so I've been very grateful, very happy to serve the Bronx for the last 11 years and look forward to doing that in the next four. Our two candidates have made it known, and we all have had a good chuckle at him taking notes. Well, I want to just yeah. clap my hands for yeah. him. Thank you. Deacon Nathan. Yeah. Deacon McCants from the Mount Haven Reformed Church taking excellent notes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. At this time, we have about 25 minutes left. I am going to pull three people from the floor. And I am going to have just a minimum of 30 second question and we're going to give the candidate two minutes to answer. So we're going to have a clergy, we're going to have an organiza community or organization person, and we're going to have a resident of this area. Is that okay with the candidates? Sure. Okay, let's, let's do it, let's do it. So right now I'm going to call my brother from Nan, his name is Herman Francis, and he's going to come and give us a 30 second question. Uh, he's a part of the Bronx chapter of Nan, so we're going to come and give him 30 seconds to ask a question to our candidates.
that we know that jail is not a solution, it's a problem, a failed educational system. Dealing with public education and the $27 billion that the city spends on public education every year, and the money that the state has not put down for the campaign of physical equity, we won the lawsuit. How are we going to deal with public education? Because every neighborhood in this city has a public school within walking distance. We will put the people in the neighborhood to work inside on public schools and use that money to stop this pipeline in these state penitentiaries. I mean, yeah, it is a good, it's a, it's a very good question. You know, we, we need to be, we need to be funding our schools so that they're not failing our children. Um, I actually was a high school, well, I actually dropped out um, from high, the first week of high school um, because I became pregnant. And I, and I agree with you that if you teach somebody to fish, they will eat forever. Um, I was very fortunate in having found a mentor at Bronx Community College who not only allowed me to go uh, to school at night to get my GED, but also uh, introduced me to a program for, work for mothers on public assistance that allowed uh, me an opportunity as the first person in my family ever to go into a, a college and to be able to go to school around my children's schedule as opposed to going into the web program. Um, you know, we need to do better by our schools because, you know, children are failing for a variety of reasons. One, you know, they're not getting the instruction that they need, they're not getting the supportive services that they need. But the schools, again, as you mentioned, as you referenced, they're underfunded and the state needs to do uh, their job. Um, I think that, you know, on the city level, we're trying. Um, again, I, I really do believe that there have to be more options because school is not an option for everyone. Right? Not everyone wants to go to school. So um, I think, you know. Wow. I had my child at 14 years old, and if it wasn't for the support of my teachers and support of mentors, um, I would never have been able to graduate from high school with a three-year-old child at my website. So I think we need to actually partner up with the parent coordinators because the parent coordinators is like the mom to all these children that's coming in there because when they get a boo-boo, they go to the parent coordinator. And the parent coordinator can actually educate our teachers on how to deal with our children, especially when they come in from a shelter situation, when they're tired all the time. When they get into class, the first thing they do is they're tired. Right, so we have to let our teachers know that it's okay for them to take a break and let them get that hour nap, you know, inside their classroom without being harassed. You know, it's going back to educating our teachers how to deal with our community because they don't know how to deal with our community because some of these teachers live in New Jersey. Right, I used to be a PTA president at River East Elementary School and my principal lived in New Jersey. I used to have to tell them like, hey dude, you don't know what this girl is going through. She came from a shelter, right? By the time she get home, it's 11 o'clock at night from that shelter because her dad had to work three jobs. So when she get to school at 7 o'clock, she missed her breakfast. So, you know, breakfast is a very good, important part of the day. So I used to hold her breakfast in the classroom for her so she could eat her breakfast and ask that teacher to give her a nap so she can rest and be productive. And then I take it a step farther, you know, because I like to be, I say all of my children. I used to have 181 children inside of River East Elementary School. So I had that children actually come and stay the night in my house for weeks and weeks at a time to give them a break from their everyday stresses because it can be very stressful um, for them to deal with that. So I think to answer your question, it goes back to holding people accountable of how they treat our children. And that's what I'm going to be doing as your city councilwoman is holding people accountable and making sure they understand how to deal with our children at all income brackets and not just how to deal with the rich ones, but also how to deal with the ones that's in the shelter, the ones whose dad is working three or four jobs and they can't check their homework, but they still need to be able to get the education. So I'm going to be a child's advocate right there by that side and making sure that every principal have a meeting again. I'm back to having a meeting. I always joke that I'm going to be this most committee person out of the city council because I'm going to have a committee for everything because I'm going to be a brand new city council person. And the best way to govern in my eyes is asking the community for their input because 
the platform that I've been running on for these last couple of days, it took me two and a half years of actually going out in the community and actually asking them, what do you want me to do to represent you? These are not things that I came up and thought it was a great running point and said, you know what, I'm going to put this on there. These are, the, they, these are your words and your mouth, so I hope that when you get me in to be your city councilwoman, you hold me accountable and you come and visit me when things are good and not when things get bad. Thank you to both candidates. At this time, I'm going to ask one of the residents from this area, Sister Denise Vaughn, to come and ask the two questions and then Lastly, we're going to have our radio personnel, Reverend Jane Lerone Russell, to come <laughs> with our last question. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Denise Vaughn. I worship here at Fort Mott Baptist Church. My question to you guys is, how much power does a council person really have? In a year from now, we hear your ideas, they sound great. A year from now, if we're having a meeting saying, why isn't this stuff accomplished? What's the red tape that will prevent you? How much power do you guys really have? What has council people before you done that actually made an impact in the community? Great question. Um, you know, we have a little bit of power. We don't have all power because, as you know, city council only just make the rules that govern the local. So it's all about great uh, forging relationships with your state senator and with your congressman so things can get moving and things can get jumping. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, for instance, uh, Mr. Williams, he, I, like, he inspired me right? He's so accessible. Everybody talks good about him. So I'm going to be actually connecting with him and trying to figure out how he can manage his job and being accessible so you don't have to come to me a year from now and saying, hey, I put you in office and you didn't do anything. But it's also your job to come and check me when things is bad too, right? So not when things is too bad. Things is like when you tell me that I was going to come and have a monthly meeting and I didn't have a monthly meeting. It's your job to call me and say, hey, Tamika, What's up with my monthly meeting, right? So governing goes two ways. It's um, residents participation as well as government participating as well. So once the community start inputting and start holding us accountable, that's where real change is going to happen. You know, because I'm only one person, and I have to deal with 50 other people who may not think that our struggles is their struggles. So, but if I have you as the community coming to my hearings and speaking up for me, they can understand our struggles, okay? So the city council has a lot of, they, they actually have a lot of power. Uh, they have a lot of land use discretion that designate, that dictate what, you know, it is in is not built in a specific community for the most part a lot of development that we see is private so it isn't always up to the council member but we're in those areas where it is the city council has a lot of discretion over those um we also negotiate the budget right and that gives us direct oversight over city agencies and it, that that means that we hold hearings and we hold uh we, we should be holding uh several the different agencies accountable when they're not doing right by the community so um you know, there is some power, but was the question around housing? No, no or just in, in, in general, yeah. I mean, it, it also depends on the council member. Um, we have council members that are a little bit more engaged in the community than others, right? In our office, for instance, we do a lot of work on the ground. We, we brought participatory budgeting to the people, giving people access to their taxpayer dollars, right? You decide how you want to spend that money. Um, so we brought that back to the community. Um, we also work diligently with our resident leaders, and they tell us what their needs are, and then we ensure that the city agency that's responsible is ensuring that that need is met. Um, so we, we can be, be a powerful force to be reckoned with if we choose to. I think it, it depends on the, the council member. At this time, we'll have Reverend Russell to come and greet us and give us a question, a final question to our candidates. There's so many questions running through my mind, but I wrote a couple of them down just so that I wouldn't ramble on and ask you too many questions. But I'm so glad that you, the last question that was asked is just relative to what I wanted to ask tonight. And that 
deals with development because that's one of the critical issues in this community and other parts of the Bronx because the Bronx is the hotbed right now of developers. We're the only ones with land and everybody wants it. That's right. And so here's the question. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but I, I do some development because I do loans and I do other kinds of things like that with, with churches and other things. So here's the question. We all know that new development will not stop and that much of the new buildings will be rented at prevailing rates. That's going to happen, yeah. right? So here's the question. In what ways can you work with HPD, because you do, <laughs> and local developers, because you can, to get local residents involved in the process so that they actually benefit financially from the development? See, here's a thought. There is, there is a part of negotiation that will allow, because the developers only want to make money. So how can we get the local residents involved so that they become a part of that resource that comes in so that they can make money in the development and don't have to move out of their residence and out of the community, but can stay with not just their salaries, but with additional income that's residual, doesn't stop. That's a good question. I know the yeah. So again, we have more discretion to do that when we're talking about public land, um, which we still have a lot of in the Bronx. We don't have that, that benefit in the East Harlem part of the district, but we do have a lot of that in, in, in the South Bronx. Um, we've had several projects that have come to fruition or in the process of coming to fruition. And what we've done, the, the way that we've tackled that is that we have ensured that the, the, the local community is involved in you know meeting with the developer um, right now, which is, is a little bit different. Um, but in Millbrook Houses, for instance, we had an infill project, right? And that meant that on 137th Street in St. Anne's, a uh, parking lot uh, was leased to, in this case, uh, for a nonprofit organization to develop 100% affordable housing. Obviously, nobody wants to give away public land. But in this case, we're trying to build housing because we're losing units to destabilization. And we have an overpopulation of seniors that live in this community that are desperately seeking this type of housing. It's 100% affordable, it's like Section 8. So, uh, but it was a process. How do we ensure that the residents that live in that development are benefiting from this agreement? Because, yeah, we're satisfying the mayor's uh, quota in terms of the number of units that he's, you know, he, he's committed to building. But what is the benefit to the existing, to the, to the immediate community and so we were able to uh, sit and negotiate um, terms for a new senior center because we needed one desperately because the one that they have right now which Alexi goes to is very tiny um, they don't have any service they don't have the you know the space to provide any programming so nothing is going on there besides people coming in to have lunch we were also able to negotiate better lighting improvements in that development because it's very dark and it's also one of the most dangerous uh, it's one of the developments where we're seeing the highest number of shootings instances in the last few years. Um, we were able to uh, negotiate uh, that one, the, the whole building was 100% affordable, but also that residents that live there have access to those apartments as well. And that's usually how, you know, the, the extent of the, of the negotiations that we have. We can put community benefit agreements in place. We can do that, but they're not legally binding. And so they don't always work. And I think that the, the best way that we have found is bringing everybody together and kind of just, you know, um, ensuring that the developers are listening to the concerns of the community and are willing uh, to give something back. All right. So I need to sit with you yeah. <laughs> to pick your mind and trying to figure out how that can be possible. So. I really haven't really thought about it, so thanks for bringing that question up to me. I was so busy of trying to preserve our affordable housing. I'm really against building anything new until we preserve the existing stock that we have. So whenever you're free, can you please educate me on that issue, please? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like to ask you both the question. We're going to give you two minutes each to just give some closing statements. But I want you also to, since we are an interfaith and religious organization, 
we want to talk about religious freedom and hate crimes to our religious community. So in your last closing statement, I'm going to ask you just to address that real quick, real briefly, so we can put some ease to our congregations at large. Thank you so much. Back to it's my job to ensure NYPD is protecting and not targeting our community. And the only way to do this is bring the community and the NYPD together on a monthly basis. I would not tolerate any hate crimes that will protect everyone's religious freedom in this district. It's only when we have constructive dialogue from all stakeholders and open lines of communication that we can tackle the issues that plague our community by working together. It's all about working together and understanding each other's background. Because once we understand each other's background, we'll be able to live together. Well, you know, we see that we're living in a time where we have a president that has given uh, basically permission uh, to extremists um, to voice their hatred and their disdain for us all. And I include myself because I know a lot of uh, my friends, uh, people that I have known for many years, were so upset over Bernie Sanders losing that they actually voted for Trump. And they said, he's not after us, he's after the Mexican community. And I said, oh, did you really think that we were not part of the Mexican community? Did you think that he thought of us anything better? Did you think that he thought that we were naturalized American citizens? He does not. Um, I do not condone hatred. Of, of any kind. Um, I do not condone police surveillance of mosques, of political institutions, of religious groups, of student bodies, and I will do everything in my power to ensure that that does not happen. We do have some uh, laws already in place that prohibit such behavior. There's always oversight that needs to occur to ensure that those laws are being adhered to. And if elected to the city council, I promise to work with our legislative team to ensure that we have the strongest legislation possible, uh, the strongest laws that protect our community residents. our community concerns and our audience members. We want to encourage you to continue to interact with the candidates on their social media, media platforms. And I also want to remind you again that the ushers have pledge cards for you to fill out so that you can make your pledge to vote. Now, each candidate will have one minute to give closing remarks. Please use this time to remind the audience why they should vote for you. You have one minute. One minute? Oh. One minute. All right. <laughs> All right, so 140 words, right? So my name is Tamika Mapp, and um, you know, like I said before, I've been a district resident for this community for the past 10 years. I'm the only candidate in this race talking about raising the minimum wage to $20 per hour because I think we need someone that's bold like me to shake up the establishment to make sure that our quality of life is being taken care of. Um, I also think that it's not, not always the most experienced or the most qualified is most effective. The city council job is actually trying to build relationships and being relatable to the district and be able to talk everybody's language inside the district and be able to meld like one of you, right? So if I could talk your language and bring it back to the city council so my colleagues can understand where we're coming from, we just made um, leeway, we just made change, and we just made an impact on how to get things done. I'm the type of person that I roll up my sleeves and I pitch in any time and any chances I get. If I'm at an event, if they look like they need help, I'm going to pitch in. That's the kind of candidate that I am. I'm always going to be in the community. and. Time is up, so that's me. <laughs> what is your name again? Oh, Tamika Mappin, I'm number two on the ballot. <laughs> I am Diana Ayala. 
Um, I'm actually running for the city council because I, one, I've been in this district for over 20 years, first in senior services and through the last 11 years with the New York City Council Speaker. And um, when I took the job at the city council speaker's office, I was very reluctant because I didn't have any political experience. But what I did have was life experience, the life experience of being uh, a teenage parent, of being um, a high school dropout, the victim of domestic violence, of being homeless, of being hungry. Um, all of those experiences taught me the skills that I needed to provide a service to this community. Because a lot of the times, the people that were coming into our offices had those shared experiences, and I was able to help guide them through that. I have a, a genuine love for my community, and I only want to see it grow, and I only want to see it prosper. I don't have any ulterior motives. I, don't, I have never run for public office before. I believe that we need more women in the city council. We're running out of them. Thank you. We're almost extinct in the city council, so that's a big issue for me. Um, but I love my community. Thank you for your responses. Okay. I now have two final things to ask you. This requires a simple yes or no. So you have 10 seconds. You okay. Say yes or no. <laughs> you each have um, given information about our faith over fear platform. Do you endorse our faith over fear platform? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if elected, do you commit? to meet with our community again within the first 100 days of taking office. I could do better, let's do 30. Wow. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you for giving us your time today. Thank you for being here. To the audience, thank you for giving up your evening to come and to be with us, to listen to the candidates, to think deeply about the things that you have heard, and just to spend your time with us. I want to say thank you to the clergy who are here. Thank you for those uh, members of Fort Mott who are here. Thank you for the members of the Mott Haven Reformed Church who are here. <laughs> We've heard a lot tonight. Uh, but this is only the first step, okay? This is only the first step. Please read the voter guides. We will have more printed in Spanish, and so let us know if you need more voter guides for your community members. Share the guides with your friends, share them with your families, share them with your neighbors, and reach out to these candidates to continue to have conversations with them. Our goal as an interfaith community is to continue to lead our community in coming together. We cannot do this isolated. We cannot do this individually and alone. We have to stand together as a community. Okay. And so we have a lot of work to do. Don't want you to forget to leave your contact information, your pledge cards, and uh, so that we can stay in touch and we can work together. I have one last thing that I want to say before I turn it over to Reverend Duckett. I want to thank you, Reverend Duckett, for opening up your house of worship, for us to be here this evening. And everybody should have gotten a flyer about the mud. Hey. Now see, now that's my youth leader. I have, I have to own her. Everybody should have gotten a flyer about our community block party. We do a community, and this is for the community. Even though we're on 146th Street, this is for the community. We do a community block party every year. Our block party this year is September the 9th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., come. There's going to be food. There's going to be a lot of good stuff. 
So just come on by and spend some time with us. <laughs> and now I'm going to turn it over to Reverend Zach. Come on, let's put our hands together and thank God for this wonderful, wonderful occasion. Our time is well spent. We thank these two candidates, beautiful young woman who came and spoke about the issues in our community. So we are, we are tremendously thankful for you finding that robbery to come out and just speak to us in the forgotten part of District 8. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to ask each person to stand, and as you stand, I'm going to ask you to hold someone's hand. This... This... That, I would like to thank Pastor Silly and MRCH or MC. Yes, I'm trying to. Go ahead. I had it right the first time. MHRC, MHRC, and FMBC for coming out and supporting these these two candidates and your two pastors. Amen. So I thank you for that. Uh, since we're inviting people to uh, events, <laughs> I, I got one better for you. Uh, uh, MHRC starts at 10 a.m. on Sundays. Uh, FMBC starts at 12 p.m. on Sundays. So if you're looking for anywhere to go, you can go to one of the two churches which are down the block from each other. Amen. Amen. Uh, <laughs> thank Pastor Osorio, who, who does pastor right around the corner. Amen. 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 Also, on uh, September the 4th, which is Labor Day, I'm pretty sure everybody has off, uh, Fort Mont hosts a prayer station, a cookout in St. Mary's Park. And, and what we do is that we pray, we hand out tracts, we sing songs, and we stand in the middle of the park and prevent, profess Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So we want you, if you're not busy on the 4th, to come out. It's all day. We start before the sun comes up and leave after the sun comes down. So please, ladies and gentlemen, if you're not busy on the 4th or the 9th, come out to both community events. St. Mary's Park is right around the corner on St. Anne's Avenue. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh God, for we know that this is the day you have made. And we know that, O oh God, that we're going to rejoice. We're going to support each candidate. We're going to support each other. And we're going to support the Bronx, New York. We pray, O oh God, that as we leave this place, that you will keep us under your blood. And like our scripture said earlier, that we will be strong and courageous. So, Heavenly Father, we pray, O oh God, that you give both of these candidates the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding of how to lead your people in this dangerous and treacherous time. This is our prayer, that you give us traveling mercies back home. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. And the people of God said, Amen. amen. There are several things that make the Bronx the Bronx. Uh, first of all, it is the only borough of the city of New York that is attached to the mainland. And as a result, of course, it means that the people of the Bronx are the only true Americans in New York City. But the Bronx has many advantages. One of the advantages, of course, are the people. 
We have people living in the Bronx who's from every single continent on the face of the earth, and they all get along. The Bronx has 14 colleges and universities, which makes the Bronx the borough of universities. It also has 25% of its land mass as parkland, which is a, the largest percentage of any of the boroughs of the city of New York, and therefore the Bronx is also the borough of parks. The Bronx is the place where two of the founding fathers of this country came from. Lewis Morris, who signed the Declaration of Independence, and Gouverneur Morris, uh, his half-brother, who was one of the principal framers of the Constitution of the United States. And they are both buried in the Bronx at St. Anne's Episcopal Church on St. Anne's Avenue on 140th Street. The Bronx is the place where you have the Bronx Zoo, where the bison was saved from extinction. Just north of it is the New York Botanical Garden, where puffed rice and puffed wheat were created. The Bronx is the place where salsa music flourished in the 1950s and 60s, with the number of nightclubs and performance spaces, and the number of the great uh, salsa musicians came from the Bronx. The Bronx is also the place where hip hop began in 1973 at 1520 Cedric Avenue. And of course, that has spread throughout the entire world. Uh, the Bronx is a place where you have many people who have become major authors. We can go as far back as the 19th century with Edgar Allan Poe, and his home is still in the Bronx and is open to the public. Talking about creative arts, uh, there are uh, many people who are actors who have been given awards both on, for Broadway and Hollywood. We can go to Anne Bancroft and uh, Tony Curtis and to Red Buttons, and we can also go to other actors who are on their way like S.A. Morales. But we can also uh, take a look at uh, the people who create the screenplays and the, uh, and the plays themselves. For instance, Clifford Odets, one of the major American playwrights, comes from the Bronx. Of course, nobody can really tell you what is going to happen in the future, but I think everything that has happened in the past has laid a good foundation for the future. We are together. And for the last 20 years, we have been building on a vision to share our views, our voices, on our channels. We are the Bronx. We are BronxNet. Well, I got this as a paid internship. Spending my time here, I really enjoyed the people that work here. I enjoy what goes on behind the scenes. So far, I've learned how to operate a camera, how to host. I learned how to control audio. My first time hosting was really nerve-wracking but I really enjoyed it because it was a new experience. Coming to you from our BronxNet studios, four new shows highlighting some of the best of the Bronx has to offer. We sit down with political leaders on In the District, 
and discuss local legislation, events, and issues. See how the community and business come together with The Bronx Now on BronxNet. Nosotros features leaders from a Latino community. Meet those who are moving to make a difference in public service, business, arts, and culture. Looking for new and exciting dining experiences? Then you'll want to savor the Bronx and try new restaurants and eateries that fill the borough with delicious dishes. We have it all, so experience the Bronx in new and fresh ways on BronxNet.